Goodness, Chish, it's always nice to have our tribal leadership open a meeting with us um, here today. And before I get started, I'd also like to recognize if there's any other tribal leaders in the audience, um, if you would just stand or any uh, tribal council persons. Um, um, it's important for us to, to uh, encourage those relationships. So let me go ahead and get started uh, officially. How's that? Kusin yohatu asak suka adi ayahat kagwan tanyeri yehit dak. In my Tlingit language, um, I'm introducing myself as I typically do. Um, my Tlingit name is Kusin. I'm from the Raven Sakai clan. Come from the Raven House in Haines, which is actually called Deshu um, by our own people. And it um, gives me great pleasure to be here today. I was totally excited when I walked in the room. I know everybody else was too, right? Because I really felt like we were just having a reunion. And I looked at every single table and there was somebody that I knew that had been played one role in the past or one role in this conversation about home ownership. And everybody I knew had carries that passion. And so it's really exciting for me to be able to be here this morning to kind of open up this conference on this conversation about where do we go and, um, and moving forward the home ownership, the dream of home ownership. Let me start by just telling you a little story and the story is about me. <laughs> and I, I, when I first got started, someone asked me the other day this question and they said, well, how did you first get started? And I remember, you know, I went to school and I came home and I couldn't get a job and all those other kinds of things. But I don't know if any of you guys remember the old workforce development programs, but I was a CETA employee. My tribe placed me in the housing authority and I got to do legal research because we were in the midst of a class action lawsuit against HUD and our tribal citizens were suing the housing authority and HUD, a three party suit regarding um, the challenges with our homes and the lack of home, homes and in, in home ownership and some of those challenges. And I remember having to go from village to village in my community and trying to sell them on, you know, what the settlement could look like. And I walked in and was able to go into each of their homes and I was able to have conversations with them. And immediately I felt, a pa I developed a passion for their cause. That I knew that we had to have something better and something more for our citizens of our tribal communities. That if this is what we were aspiring to, then our bar was too low and we needed to do something different. So I continued in that job or that position and, and accelerated and as Bob mentioned, um, eventually I became the executive director of the housing authority through a, a variety of um, changes in the, as we move forward. And then when I got to um, be the executive director of the housing authority, um, my first meeting was with Alaska Housing Finance Corporation. Alaska Housing Finance Corporation said, we're trying to put somebody on the board of Na National American Housing Council and we're having our nominations process and you know we got involved in that and certainly there was a, an elder from um, a North Pole, uh, from, um, excuse me, from Beryl who said, Joe Yupikitson, and he said, I nominate Jackie and I thought, wow, what am I getting myself into? And then I went to the first meeting and I met Bob Gochi and Bill Nebelink and all the rest of those folks on that board. But why would, that was so important was because we were just regular local community activists. Bob Gochi, you know, the list of us, uh, you know, and the list of you here, were regular citizens, tribal citizens, just wanting to do something and change something for our communities at home. And, we, and it was a good time for us to be able to do that. Lo and behold, we were blessed um, because we were, um, the country was, you know, the, the Congress was willing to look at some options that we put forward from the Housing Council and they created the commission on Alaska Native and Native American and uh, Native Hawaiian housing. That commission wasn't unlike what you are doing here today. We had two and a half years, but what we did was we brought together thought leaders and we talked about innovation and we looked at the data, what data we could find just like the same thing for you guys, what data you can find. We looked at the data and we said, where are we now and where do we need to go and what are those innovations that we need to have in place? And we had you know, a number of series of hearings across the country, but it all helped us to drive that data. 
It was the thought leaders coming together from the communities that were able to make those changes happen. It was driven by those that were at home that needed to be able to make that happen. And then one of those major changes that we, we had a variety, some of them unfortunately are still the same things that you'll be debating this week. There are the issues with access to capital. There's the, the issue with, not, with having um, not enough financial institutions interested in having a presence or be having a presence in our tribal communities. There's the issues of the, of the delays that happened with the processing of leases. And there's also the issues with dealing the capacity at home. Um, and so those are some of the things that, were, that are still out there. But in convening that group and putting forward that, I realized that, um, and, and, and through that process, I ended up becoming the chair of National American Housing Council. And I want to say that I think that this was one of the, not me becoming the chair of a housing council wasn't the tipping point, but the tipping point was we realized that we couldn't do it alone, that the housing authorities couldn't do it alone, that it actually had to have the tribal leaders there too, and that we had to have our community partners there too. And I remember as chair of National American Housing Council, I convened a meeting in Washington, D.C. HUD was coming up with their great big blueprint for change that they wanted to have. And guess what? Indian country's blueprint just looked like the same old HUD programs over and over again. And we weren't buying it. We just weren't going to have it anymore. And so we called together this convening. We had over 200 folks. We had a good balance between tribal leaders and housing officials because we wanted to have that balance in the room. And the conversation at hand, the toughest conversation at hand was, we came up with all our vision about what would it look like 50 years from now? What would housing look like 50 years from now if we could design and dream the dream? And we, that was the easy part. But the tough decision in the room was, who's gonna drive the train? Is it gonna be the housing authorities? Or do we believe in self-determination and make this a self-determination program and have tribal leaders be part of that process. And that was a tough conversation, but when we left that room, we made a decision that we believed in the sovereign rights of tribes and that as tribal citizens, we had to engage in a collaborative effort. And so that day, that very day, I went up to the Hill, we sold it to Congress, they said write it up, we wrote it up, through a very variety of the things and lots of partners that are in this room, we're able to pass the bill and get Nahasda in place. The vision of Nahasda was to do a couple things which was one, to recognize that the feds would never have enough money to be able to deal with our housing need, and that we had to really figure out how to leverage. Two, was design programs that actually make sense for us and not the HUD cookie cutter programs, including home ownership, that we had to realize true home ownership, and we couldn't do it through the models that were being proposed by HUD. And three, that we needed to be able to make sure that we had strong partners with our tribal governments because they were the ones who were putting in roads, they were developing infrastructure that we needed, they were part of the economic fabric of our tribal communities. And if we look at wanting to change the ratios of our poverty ratios in, in Indian country, we know, just like with the United States, that the indicators for change and economic improvement is always housing starts. Well, why shouldn't it be the same way in Indian country? Why shouldn't home ownership be the driver of economic change in Indian country? And we knew that that had to be part of that critical component. So, um, you know, we uh, uh, put that forward, the bill, and, and trying to move those things forward. And then in implementation of Nahasda, just moving really quickly forward, in moving implementation of Nahasda, we knew a couple of things. Um, was we wanted to inspire we wanted to inspire change and change programs. In fact, we had lots of debates, lots of fights in negotiated rulemaking. Some of us thought we should have incentives for people who could leverage their dollars more. Some of us felt like we needed to be able to you know, really make that happen. But we all knew a couple things and we came together in a consensus way that we had to be solidly locked together in the principles. We never ran a number on that formula, never ran the formula once until we all agreed into the principles of how to divide that money. And then we also agreed that it wasn't about holding on to our housing stock forever. It was about lifting up our people and giving them opportunities to be able to, be, uh, to, to, have, to create this culture of prosperity where our citizens 
could actually be independent and that they could have equity in their homes to be able to help them launch whatever other financial interests that they may have. Um, and so, so that's what we did. And then we recognize in the home ownership, um, we did a couple of other initiatives. You've heard about what we did with the Clinton administration. We went to Pine Ridge. Most of you were there. The partnership for housing that happened out there. One of the first, one of the first couple of nonprofits that were out there. Navajo Nation had a great nonprofit. A few others had a, a couple nonprofits. But today, nonprofits are actually and CDFIs are leading the housing industry in Indian Country. Now, I wouldn't have said I would have known that when I thought about it then. Now, we knew that nonprofits had to have a place, and we knew that we needed to develop the capacity of our tribal citizens, because at that point, and still in many of our com communities far too often, the value of the home ownership in, in the mindset isn't the same as the value of the truck payment. And so we knew that we needed to be able to create more value of home ownership so that people would actually pay um, for that value and create a market within the tribal communities. Um, and so, so with, within that environment, the, one of the greatest things I felt about Nahasda was that I would go into meetings and people were energized. All of a sudden, the creative juices were flowing, and they were thinking about what they could do with the innovation. And you saw it from tribe to tribe. Um, and that was exciting. One of the things I would say that I wish, I have a long list of things I wish I would have done differently, but at the top of the list of the things I wish I would have done differently in implementation is I wish at the very beginning we sat down with housing authorities and tribes together. I wish that we would have been able to do, that we would have done a, a, a session for tribal leaders and said, this is why, this, a training that showed them how important housing was to spurring the economic growth in their tribes. What a key leverage point that was and what their responsibility was. And it's not too late for us to do that. I wish we could have held on to the banking industry a little bit longer and a little bit more aggressively. We knew that it cost money, more for them to do their job in Indian country. We knew that we had to be the foot shoulders on the ground to help with the credit reports. We knew that we had to help fill out the applications. We knew we had to just start there. But then came the banking recession, and I know we'll hear later from Miriam Jorgensen about some of that da data. But we know that that happened, and it hurt when smaller banks got consolidated and when it became a challenge in our communities. And the strength of not having that um, so some of the banking industries. In fact, it was kind of sad to me the other day, I'm a, our tribe is one of the investors in the Native American Bank. Um, and you know, I sit on the board for Sea Alaska, and I also sit on my tribal council. And so when I'm getting those reports, I'm listening to them, I care, because it's important to me. But when I asked for the data the other day, thinking about coming to this meeting, I want to know where we are with mortgage lending, that they're not in that business right now. And uh, although they may be thinking about that again, but they're not in that business right now. And that tells me something about one of the critical gaps in, 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 in us trying to address home ownership. So, but, I, but there are tribes that have done some amazing things, amazing examples. And I, I know you guys have examples there, and, but I'll never forget one of the aha moments for me when I came to NI, NCAI was um, we took tribal leaders out and we wanted them to see the tribal communities. And when we went out to, Winneb um, to Winnebago and we went out to the tribe and they were giving us their whole economic dream. They were showing us the, you know, the tobacco packaging places and the shipping places and they were showing us other things. But then they talked to us about housing. And I was so excited because they got it. They got the philosophy that I wanted my tribe to have. And I, keep, and I, and I haven't lost that. So when they got up in there and they said, we recognize that our tribal citizens need it, you know, in order for them to understand and to be able to have the opportunity of true home ownership, that we had to deal with some of the barriers. And the first, one of the barriers was that when they went to the bank, sometimes they weren't given the same, um, let's say, um, welcome as another citizen might, of the community might have gotten. And so what they said was, OK, we're going to buy an interest in that bank. So that bank knows that when a Native person walks in, they could be an owner. They could be a part owner. And all of a sudden, it changed the dynamic. 
And then they said, we've got credit issues. And they looked at the credit issues. And the biggest credit issue was people buying cars, used cars. And you, we know how that market is. And so they said, well, we're going to do something about that. So they started their res car business. And it wasn't about selling and making cars off the money. It was about people cleaning up their credit. The whole purpose of res cars was cleaning up your credit, being able to make sure you could get a car that was affordable, pay it off, and get good credit. And so when I talked to Lance Morgan and to the tribal council about why they were doing this is because their goal, their ultimate goal, more than even home ownership, was independent citizens. They wanted to have citizens who were financially independent, that could have the wherewithal to make their own personal decisions the way that they would. And I truly at that moment understood what financial sovereignty was all about. That financial sovereignty for a tribe is absolutely critical. It's not just exercising sovereignty, but you have to have that other component to it. And I saw that alive and well in, that, in, in Winnebago creating a culture of change. And I wanted it, and I wanted to see it. You've seen other tribes do other initiatives. You saw the Okia Wenge. Joe Garcia was the president of NCAI, and so we were very well aware of it. But their, their change was driven about a need to protect their historic culture and to be able to use today's tools, the home ownership tools, to be able to make sure that those communities, that, that those, you know, those, um, their way of life for thousands and thousands of years was continued in that communal vil village that we were, they were putting together. And then you saw the innovations of tribes that, were, that grabbed on to the opportunity of the Hearth Act to be able to deal with the challenge that we have, oh, never, I don't even want to relive the thought of those meetings I had with BIA years and years ago, over and over again. And Kevin Gover and I are really good friends now, but we fought like the Dickens um, on trying to be able to deal with the whole thing of appraisals and leasing. And, and, and then you see someone like Saginaw Chippewa, who's actually been able, to, and other tribes who are actually able to be able to grab onto those opportunities and streamline that process at home. So from, rather than waiting for years, you're only waiting for days to be able to get a home ownership lease together. So those are the things that I think are really important as we look at where we go forward. Now, if we think about what our opportunities are, I look at the window of opportunity. A couple things are happening right now. Those are those who watch TV or listen to the political pundits. We know a couple things are happening. This election is primarily about the economy. And why is it so important? It's because America doesn't feel like it fully has rebounded yet. That this recession didn't really, hasn't really got us over the top. And so that's why, you know, um, lines like, you know, um, political um, mantras like Trump's wins. Because people want to feel again like they may have felt about America before. But it's so important for us to recognize that for Indian country, this is an opportunity. So when people are focused on the economy, we can't be silent. We have to be at the table with what it is that we want and what we need. And to be able to take the leverage point of Obama administration, who allowed tribes to sit at the table for very critical policies, to be able to make sure that we're putting forward the recommendations for the next administration, to be able to make sure that we have our wish list ready in the transition document. And NCAI is, is already developing our transition document. We've already got it drafted, looking for recommendations. I already told several of you here that out of this meeting, I'm expecting that you will send us some of those recommendations to include. So that as we move forward to the next administration, as we move forward to the next Congress, that we have a game plan because it's doable and achievable. What we have accomplished in 20 years with home ownership is amazing. We've had a few roadblocks. We still have some of the same issues. We've been able to learn something from where we're going, but we know how to address those challenges. So I know that you know, when I go home to my tribe and I did a strategic planning about trying to put, how, how do we um, initiate this culture of prosperity in our communities? That is something that we all want to achieve. And to me, it's not just financial prosperity. It's a feeling of prosperity. It's a feeling that my health and my well-being is connected with, the, my, with all the pieces of opportunity. Because you can't segregate, and we've said so many years, 
housing isn't just about housing. Housing is about the child's ability to learn when they go to school in an environment that's safe. Housing is about being able to live in a place that you feel protected. So we know that creating this feeling of prosperity. So I do want to be able to make sure that when we leave here, we leave here with solid recommendations for moving forward. I too know that there are many things that I would do differently. I wish that as tribes we didn't fight so dang hard not to give the feds any information about us or any data. Because boy, if we would have had some means of ongoing data collection, we could have been stronger advocates in Congress. It's a weakness, we've got to figure out how to deal with it. I wish that we could have found a way to deal with the economies of scale and the formula so that we didn't have, you know, we didn't have the disparities of the haves and the have-nots and the large and the not so large, that we would have been able to find a medium ground for that. I wish, as I said, that we had tribal leaders more at the forefront to be able to say, listen, this is an economic driver in your community, pay attention, this could be the change agent for how we move forward. I wish that we would have had a way of being able to share more um, of the best practices and innovations because there are so many who want to be able to make home ownership become the dream of, of their community and, 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 less, and we were less dependent on holding on to the current assisted stock. And I know that with you guys in the room that we'll have those, those, those changes. So I know that road's challenging, but I know people like when you hear about Aaron Big Eagle from the Crow um, Creek Sioux Tribe, and you hear those stories about how she had a dream and how by through her nonprofit um, CDFI that they taught her the skills that she needed to deal with her credit score. And that through that dream, she was not only able to achieve home ownership, but she was also able to achieve, achieve being able to have her own business and to be able to aspire to, great, to greater things for not for her community, but also for her, her home. I was listening to Chairman McLeod last week when I was at Bismarck, and Chairman McLeod was telling me the story about how he went to another community, and he was um, in New York, and he said, wow, look, at there's a lot of food vendor trucks around here, and he kind of likes tacos, and so he said, why can't my, in Turtle Mountain, why can't we have a taco truck? And then he bought a taco truck, and now he has a fleet of taco trucks in Turtle Mountain. <laughs> But that's the, the, the can-do attitude that we need to have. We have a can-do attitude. We've got the right people in the room, and I'm so glad to be part of you. Thank you. Goodness, Chish.